I start this morning, I received a letter from uh, Sally Rice. This was John Ressler's sister. I to read it to you guys. It says, on behalf of my brother, Brower, our family and myself, a special heartfelt thanks to you and to your congregation. Thank you for receiving him as a member in your church. Through you, he found peace within himself and the love of God. Your church was his salvation for forgiveness and eternal life. We are so glad you were able to pray for and pray with him the night before he passed. You and your members of the church are a comfort to us as you helped him through this difficult time and stayed by his side through his health complications. God bless, sincerely, Sally Rice and Brower Bressler. Amen. I thought that was nice. I wanted to share that with you. Amen. <coughs> How many of you guys have ever seen a really large bull? Bull? Bull, yeah, bull. B U L L. Yeah. The bell cow. Uh, <laughs> How many of you have ever gotten to a pen with one of those things? <laughs> Do you need to respect them? Oh, yeah. yeah. I seen one of those things hit a car and almost flipped the car. It's a small car, but it's still a car. A bull. How do you keep a bowl that weighs tons inside a small, really small, fenced in area? Any ideas? Give me what he wants. <laughs> How many of you guys have ever been shocked by electricity? Raise your hand. How many of you guys have ever been shocked by really bad with electricity? Raise your hand. I work for Florida Hospital, and you, you, you never know what you're going to run into there because some of these places that they have are so old that I had what I thought was an irrigation pipe. It was white PVC uh, that was broken. It was right by a light post that was running 240. No, actually, it was running 480. Okay? And this pipe was on top of another pipe that broke and I had to get uh, both of them out of the way. So this hole is filled with water, and I take my metal saw and I start cutting this thing. Oh, no. God you. Yeah, tell me there's not a God. Because I hit this, and, and I broke through it, and it hit something in there that gave me the shock of my life. Now, I've been shocked many times before. Uh, this was probably one of the worst. And right after that, and I realized where that line went, and I realized how lucky I was, I knew, again, there was a God. Another time when I was a kid, have you ever wondered what would happen if you stuck a knife in that red coil on a toaster? <laughs> never, that thought never entered any of your mind. Yeah. Seriously? It sparked a lot. <laughs> I wondered, what would happen if I took this knife and touched that red thing? And I did, and it took that knife, and this is a butter knife. Now, you guys remember back in the 70s when cork was something that you actually decorated your home with? Cork board? I was standing at the toaster, and the door to the garage was behind me. Probably where that, that birdie is right there. And I touched that red thing, and it took that knife, and it flung it into that door, and it stuck. <laughs> From there, I realized that electricity was pretty cool. You could turn a switch on, you had light, gave you heat, gave you air conditioning. But I also realized you had to be afraid of that stuff at times. Garrett? Janet was in, uh, our, this is back at the lake in Missouri. And our bedroom had a big picture window on it and looked out over the lake. And in the middle of our yard was this huge oak tree. It was mm -hmm. three and a half foot trunk. Wow. And she hears this giant explosion and this flash of light that lit up the inside of the bedroom like, like a flash bulb. It was super bright. Lightning had hit that tree, and I never understood how, how it all happened, but I guess the, the heat and the force from that electricity turns the, lit, the fluid in the tree to steam and it can't contain it, and it all happened so fast, it just exploded. You ever see a pine tree get hit by lightning? Yeah. yeah it weird. takes a sap and puts it on fire. Yeah. It exploded. Which shot these pieces several hundred feet and shoved them down into the ground, and the, the ground up there is clay and rock. You can't hardly stick a shovel in it, but it so, shoved these wood down in it. Is electricity powerful? 
<laughs> Does it deserve respect? Yes. How about fear? Yeah. No. No? No, no fear? Touch it one time and see if it doesn't spark. <laughs> Have you ever touched a spark bug? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had a weed eater that the, uh, you know, it has that, that rubber cap on top of the spark bug. Well, that, that wasn't there no more. And you're out there in the summertime and you're sweating and you're holding this thing on an angle, the spark bug comes right up and hits you right in the back of the arm. Funniest thing to see when it's not you doing it. <laughs> Now, my guys didn't respect that weed eater. They were afraid of that weed eater, okay? Because they knew. And if you sweat it, now I had a guy that was from Las Vegas. He didn't sweat. Don't know why, but he didn't sweat down there. But I sweat, and I had another guy working with me. He sweated a lot, and you could just see him. Well, actually, you heard him because every time I touched him, you heard certain words that came out of his mouth. He didn't want to use it after that. And you can see it in his eyes and man, go grab that weed. It's like, mm -hmm. that wasn't respect, that was fear. Okay, listen, I told you about a boat, right? Let me read you a story here. This man, Tim Matsis, while working my way through boarding school, I was told of a bull with a reputation for being extremely dangerous. It was very large and muscular and charged at anything that came within what it considered its domain. When having to move the bull around the farm, its owners never entered the paddock in person. They did it from the safety of the truck. Sometimes the truck came off a little worse for wear. Just imagine the damage that beast could have done if it had escaped its paddock and made its way into a crowd or onto the main highway. Fortunately, there was a good reason the bull never got out. The reason was that was around the perimeter of the paddock was a wire that ran a reasonably strong dose of electrical current. Okay? And despite the animal's utter contempt for the farm workers, the truck, and just about everything else, it showed that electric fence great deference. The same power that gives us light, heat, and numerous other conveniences was recognized by a crazed animal to be worthy of great respect. In fact, Anyone who knows anything of electricity knows it is both to be appreciated and feared. Now let me tell you something. I work for Florida Hospital. Florida Hospital is very clear in their procedures and their guidelines of what you can and can't do on their properties. And if you are working around electricity, or you're messing with the electricity itself, they have very clear guidelines, and if you're not following them, they will kick you off the job at that moment, and they may fire you. And it doesn't matter if you're a huge company or just uh, a day laborer. You understand? Why? Because electricity is a great convenience, but it needs to be shown respect because it can kill you. Is that right? Yeah. All right. All right. We're told in the book of Exodus, chapter 19. Do you know what Exodus 20, that chapter is about? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, right? But what happens before chapter 20? Well, chapter 19, right? And so in chapter 19, God is going to come and visit His people. Now, put yourself in their place. You have come out... Three months ago, you were a slave in Egypt, and your ancestors for 400 years have been in Egypt. And now, the God of the universe is going to come and meet with you, and you're going to stand in His presence. Now, if you think electricity deserves respect, what would you do if... Your spiritual leader told you that God was coming in three days. Be ready. Okay? Turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. <coughs> okay, you guys looking at your watch? No. Do you think I'm going to finish in ten minutes? No. Thank you. <laughs> it's always a chance. It's always a chance. Hope burns eternal. 
chapter 19. Let's look at verse 9. Verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and believe you forever. God wanted to come, not only to give the law, but also to show the people that Moses was God's spokesperson. Amen. And that Moses had authority directly from God himself. The question is, is why does God come from the thick cloud? I thought God was light. <laughs> okay, so Ray, you're laughing. Why did he come to these people in a thick cloud? Because if he revealed himself, they would fail to be to exist. I love it. So God is light, and light emanates from him. Is that right? And if the people were to see that light, what would happen? They would cease to exist. He would consume them because our God is a what? Consuming, Consuming fire. fire. Do you guys understand what that means? It's kind of like electricity. That when you flip the switch and it puts the light on, gives you heat, gives you fans, they give you air, it's great. But if you touch that, Okay, if you were to break into that bulb and touch that element in there, or be stupid like my brother and I and stick things up in there, <laughs> what happens? You get to feel the power of what electricity really is. Okay, so God tells Moses, I'm going to come before my people, but I'm going to have to lay down some guidelines before I come. And the people need to hear what you say. And I want them to hear my voice so they know when you speak, that you speak for me. Okay? Was God <clears throat> playing around? No. Was God coming to Moses in a casual way? No. No. I've said this before and I'll say it again. We do not serve a casual God. Do you remember when coming to church in shorts was one of the big things going through the churches? You can dress however you want. And I never understood that. I never understood that because I understand, and I understood even then, slightly, the majesty of God. If my mother was inviting her mother and her father, would I come to that dinner dressed casually? And the answer would be no. So if I was to show that kind of respect to my grandparents, why would I not just show that respect to God? The problem that we have is we continuously want to make God after our own image. Now listen, God understood that when He came and He would approach His people and He would talk to them, that they would become familiar with Him. And that in that familiarity, there was a chance of them losing sight of his awesomeness, his holiness, and his power. And so, do you ever wonder why God came to a bunch of slaves in such a powerful way that scared them to death? Get their attention. Did it get their attention? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Understand their background. They came from 400 years of slavery in a land that were was filled with idolaters. They worshipped anything that crawled or anything that was in the sky. They worshipped everything. Everything to them was a God. And yet he was the real God, the creator of everything coming to them. What would you do in your 21st century technology-filled life if God was to appear in front of you? You know what? You better have an answer for that because someday if you won't appear in front of you, you will appear in front of him. And depending on your relationship with him is going to depend on what the outcome of that appearance will be. Never forget, if there's one thing you remember in this sermon, remember that our God is a what? Consuming fire. He deserves respect because of who and what he is.
The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. You find what their words were back up in verses um, 7, 8. Okay? Verse 10, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people. And what's that next word? Okay, hold on one at a time. I heard the word consecrate. What's the other word? Sanctify. Sanctify. Those words are interchangeable. What does consecrate or sanctify mean? To make holy. Were these holy people? Okay. Now, I want you to see here, see if you can figure if there is a correlation between our terms of and our view of justification and sanctification and what's going on here. Because these people are going to stand right before God. Right? And God tells Moses to go down and do what to them? Consecrate or sanctify them. What does sanctification mean? Set apart for holy use. Set apart for holy use. Now, in your relationship with God, when does sanctification come? It's the work of a lifetime. It's the work of a lifetime, right? All the days of your life. So, there has to be something else that we as fallen human beings need besides sanctification. What is that other word? Justification. All right, justification. Now, God tells Moses to sanctify the people, but he says nothing about justification. Have you thought about this? Where does the justification come from? Jesus. It comes from God himself, right? All right, so God is going to meet with them. He has justified them, and they're going to need to be sanctified. The work of a lifetime. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think about this? Because I'm going to end right there on that part. You think about that. I'm not. Uh, you think about that. You think about that. Like I said, there's correlation there. It's deep, but you you, you have to think think about it. Okay. So, the Lord said to Moses, verse ten: Go to the people, consecrate them, or sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them do what? Why do they need to wash their clothes? God don't like stains on your uh, shirt. This is symbolic here, right? Yes. Okay. And they're washing their clothes and they're washing themselves. Now listen, in the sacrificial service, what did the priest do for the Day of Atonement, on the Day of Atonement, before he went into the most holy place? There was a basin there with with with, it wasn't like a mirror like we have glass. I believe it was gold that was polished that they could see themselves. Bronze, right? And so they had to wash themselves, right? There's significance there when it comes to our understanding of justification and sanctification and what God does, okay? Now, can you imagine... They saw the power of God in sending the ten plagues on Egypt. They saw the last plague and they heard all the cries of all the people that lost their firstborn. Then God split the Red Sea for them. And then for three months God fed them in the wilderness. Okay? And now God is saying, I'm going to come and actually stand before you. And you got three days to make yourself ready. Three days. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, consecrate them today, tomorrow, and let them wash your clothes, and let them be ready for the, which day? Third day. The third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around. This is a fence, a perimeter. You shall not pass this point. And if you pass this point, you're not going to like the outcome. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves. What is that? 
What does that phrase, take heed to yourselves, mean? Tighten up. Tighten up. You better listen. This is very important. This wasn't like, okay, uh, suggestion. Yeah, it wasn't a suggestion. This was take heed and listen because if you disobey this, you are going to die. Yeah. This is a life and a death situation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Do you see that? This is a life or death situation. If you pass this point, you're going to die. No ifs, ands, or buts. No judge is going to come and get you off of this. You're not going to be able to pay a lawyer to get you out of this. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. Was God serious? Okay, so, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch it. You can't even touch its what? Border. Do not touch the base of the border. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be what? Put to death. Put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. Don't even let the animals go up there. Why not the animals? Any ideas? They become sanctified. They become holy. Okay, because sin has corrupted everything on this planet. God is a holy God. And if sin comes near him, God doesn't lose his temper, but God is a consuming fire. He isn't a consuming fire in an evil way that we may think. He's a consuming fire because of his holiness, his righteousness, his justice. This is why I told you in the past that sin was never part of God's plan. Because God is a consuming fire and he consumes sin wherever it is, unless he sanctifies and justifies. Amen? Amen? Now look at this, brothers and sisters, and look at how serious this event is. Why were the people, if they, if they disobeyed, why were they not to be killed by your hand? Why did they have to be shot or stoned? Because if you touched them, then you became defiled. Understand that? There's so much meaning to what's going on here that if you think about these things and dwell on them and see what God is trying to say to us, He's trying to get us to understand what His character is, who He is. He is God Almighty. There is no one else like Him. There is no other gods, no other person. He stands above everything. Amen. He is God. Think about this. This powerful being loves you so much that he wants to be with you. He wants you to be able to stand in his presence. He wants to have a relationship with you. But he can't do that if your sin is separating you from him. God is a consuming fire. He does not play with sin, and he wants his people to understand the sinfulness of sin. Verse 14, well, let's go 13. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. I'm going to ask Ed to do something for me. Okay, Donald, where are you at? Hmm? Here he is. Can you open those doors? Open those. And if you could stand back there by that table, by the table back there. Now you've heard him play the trumpet. And, and, and I know when he plays the trumpet, he's very reserved. Okay? <laughs> I want to hear what a loud blast from his trumpet sounds like, but I don't want to blow your eardrums out, so I asked him to step back there. Can you give us one? How about that now? Stay right there. You guys see how far away he is? No. Oh, you can get up and look if you want. So I want you to do it one more time. Can you do it one more time? Cover your ears if you have to. Wow. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. <laughs> One trumpet. From a pretty good distance. And some of us had to hold our ears, right? 
Now, can you imagine what the trumpet of God sounds like? That's one trumpet. Now, see, I wanted to hear him do something like that in here. To where people shriek. You know what I'm That's why I'm not a musician. Thank you. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. In verse 14, so Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of a trumpet was what? Very loud. You heard that trumpet. Can you imagine the sound of the trumpet of God? Now, we're in a building. They're out in the desert. God comes down on this mountain, and He comes down with the sound of a trumpet. Now, where else in the New Testament do you hear about God coming with the sound of the trumpet? The voice of the archangel. Okay? And with the voice of the archangel. Now, you've heard the statement, that could raise the dead. Okay? Thank you. That was really good. I like that sound. That was loud. Next time we'll have to do it from here. <laughs> okay. okay. Do you understand that the trumpet of God, the voice of God, is a sound that could raise the dead? I mean, really raise the dead? So listen. Magnify that. Oh, maybe a hundred times. Okay? And if you were the children of Israel, would that get your attention? Huh. Listen now. God understood our human nature. It may have made some of them fear, but some of them wanted to know what that was. Okay? Hence the perimeter. Hence don't come up and go past this point. Because there are some of us that just want to know. We're like cats. But what's the saying about cats? Curiosity killed them, right? Satisfaction brought it back. <laughs> oh my goodness. It came to pass, this is verse 16, that on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp, what? Trembled. Trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely 